Hello, Matilda. I'm going to go with Chris Kowski. Am I close? Fairly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome to Design and Dialogue. It's fantastic to see you. You are calling in from Berlin. I understand. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, um, as Lucy said, please let us know if you're in the audience where you are calling in from. And if you have questions, put them in the chat box. We'll get to them at the end. We're going to have a sort of interesting experience here because Matilda is going to digitally bring her, us into her mind. At least that's the plan uh, with a desktop exhibition. And what I'm hoping is that we can get Matilda some texture and a uh, sense of the incredible scope of your activities. Um, I recently called you an impresario, uh, which was a word I grasped for to just try to describe what it is that you do because you're a designer, you're a curator, you're a networker, theorist, thinker, writer, and the list goes on. Um, can you just say a little bit about how you think of yourself and what you do for a living? You know what, when, you, when I read this, I was laughing because I remember two or three years ago at the Design Biennial in Istanbul, we were standing outside and I think there was a bunch of people, Justin McGurk was there, Lara Sacchetti, Jana Scholze, and somehow I mentioned that I used to be, a, like I was never a bouncer, but I used to stand from the age of 17 in front of a club, hosting different events and allowing people to walk in or walk out. So I was kind of a gatekeeper in that kind of sense. Mm. And then I remember Justin McGurk said to me, it totally makes sense, Matilda. I, I see your profession. I see what you're doing in the different themes and, and topics and formats that you develop. And then I look into how you have might have started and it totally makes sense. So yes, it, sometimes I actually think I'm rather a host than a curator and rather a host than a designer. But I do use design um, as a discipline to build with different types of projects. And what I uh, mainly do is at the moment, I do make exhibitions. I, and I also do run a lot of workshops in an educational sense. Uh, I was a visiting professor at the School of Art Institute for a year in the architecture and design department. And right now I'm developing a huge exhibition that opens in October at the Museum für Gestaltung that is gonna be called Total Space. And I will talk about it also. But uh, I very much shift between the digital and physical space all the time. And uh, I think my biggest, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, drive of within this profession is that I'm very much not only interested in my own work, but I'm very much interested in the work of others. And I want to implement that work of others and the, the mindset of others into my work all the time. Mm -hmm. Because I think that in the, within the dialogue, there's very fantastic and exciting things that can happen that you, that are usually completely un, unexpected. Uh, but that always bears a great surprise and also pushes the discipline and mm -hmm. the cultural landscape further. Yeah. I love the uh, uh, the image or metaphor of you as somebody standing in front of a door letting people in or not and the idea of access because like it or not anybody who works curatorially if we consider that to be a commonality between all of your activities some kind of curatorial activity everybody who works that way has to face up to the fact that we are in an attention economy and what you're essentially doing is distributing attention and therefore giving access to people or not. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit before we get to specific examples about what I almost want to call the political philosophy of your work and what you're trying to achieve in terms of giving access to what you've called polyphonic voices. In other words, distributing um, awareness to people who might not have the platform. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little bit something that my uh, work colleague Bera Sacchetti because I also have a curatorial practice that I hope will also shift more in the spatial practice that we call foreign legion global but foreign because we are foreign and we are everywhere and obviously we do that or we we coined that uh, name from a female perspective of not having maybe also access to certain uh, uh, platforms or certain networks but one thing that we established from the very early beginning when we started to work is it was a rule. It's a simple rule. It's the 50%. It's like when we do a project or we work and develop any kind of project, we always have to bring 50 people in that we don't know and have never worked with, you know, because that way um, you activate something that is extremely magical. It's also much more dangerous because you don't know how the people work, what they will deliver. It's extremely, you know, like working with a lot of ex unexpected um, uh, frameworks, but the outcome is surprising. And then you have, you bring these polyphonic voices in that you maybe you don't source from yourself in that kind of sense. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's, um, let's open up your screen and mm -hmm. 
and take the deep dive into what you've been doing. Um, okay. As I say, this is going to be a little bit of an unusual, well, a little departure for us because it's going to be non-linear. It's kind of going to be totally non-linear. So, so, so I, I maybe. I'm maybe going to start a little bit from, I mean, what, what you, got, you see here is my, actually, my real world, which is a virtual world. It's my desktop background, uh, which is basically that I've never been interested in a presentation, in a linear presentation as such, uh, and a PowerPoint presentation when you go from the beginning to the end. Uh, but that's also where very much stands for my work methodology, where I think you have to much, be much more relational and react on things that happen, you know? So also within the conversation that I have with you, I would lead this conversation with someone else differently than I would with you, depending on what we're talking about and what the questions uh, are. So as you can see, this is my desktop background and I have two literal shelves in the background where I, on the right side here, have most of my work. Uh, and on the left side, work that uh, is also my work, but it's also on a dear, like, um, dear to me on a different level. And then um, maybe I open this because it references very much what I just talked about with the, the work with Vera uh, Sacchetti with Foreign Legion, for example, we've been developing since last year a publication that, that is basically a method as a book or the book as a method where we want to actually bring 50% uh, of voices into this publication that we know and this 50% will suggest other people that, that will become part of the book and that way you know, you have a physical item, a designed object that kind of transfers this idea of how can an institution, but how can also a gatekeeper or, or single person bring these things, uh, these ideas to the fore or kind of, or implement this kind of methodologies. And um, this visualization is something that I designed for Foreign Legion together with Vera, because obviously before you start developing a book, you have only a concept, but you don't know how it looks like. But in order to convince other people to, to support you by making this publication, you have to make images, you have to make objects, you have to make things visible in order to start to start the conversation. So as you can see, you know this is something that um, that is like my daily workspace because I usually work internationally, very widely internationally, even though I I'm based in Berlin at the moment. But I want to explain to you a little bit what the desktop exhibition as such is, because I was running an institution for seven years. I was an artistic director and we co-founded it as a collective. But then, you know, after working in a space for seven years and moving objects to one space to the other, I was invited by Chus Martinez, who uh, runs uh, the Institut Kunst in Basel. She is a curator and she is a director to come and make an exhibition. Uh, or give a lecture. And I said, listen, Chus, I don't really actually want to make only an exhibition, but I would like to actually uh, lecture, I want to make an exhibition. So what I did is I treated the desktop background as floor plan, as, as an actual physical space, mm -hmm. as you can see. Tom Hancock, a designer from, from New York, he made the scenography based on, obviously I told him what kind of, what are the exhibits, what are the items that, that we have here. And what basically happens is it's like walking through a space, but walking through uh, a digital space. So all my guests within this desktop exhibition are sitting usually in a lecture room. And what I do is I click on these different uh, files that are MP4 files or JPEGs or PDFs um, or GIFs. And then I talk the exhibits through. So this, in this case, um, the exhibition was called Gender and Technology because it was this, it's important, was called uh, Is Technology Sexist? <laughs> and um, I basically brought different kind of voices into, into the conversation that I thought are important or should be talked about. One work, as you can see here, for example, is Programming the Body. It's a video work by a Dutch designer called Joanna Huckert. She really analyzed how the design of the pill as in the designed object, how it's basically uh, used against the female body and how a female body is then trained to be basically dependent on that kind of hormonal kind of uh, intake. Mm. Uh, but it's, not, it's a beautiful video because she uses existing video footage like, you know, from Alice in Wonderland uh, to Mary Poppins a spoonful of sugar and then she mixes it up with video footage from her own childhood of her mother that basically suffered from depression based on the intake of a pill and 
for me, it was really important on one hand as a curator to have that possibility in an art related audience to talk about design, not specifically based on objects, but specific, uh, specifically about narrating the story of or history of design based on these different kind of uh, examples. And I commissioned also things. Um, I commissioned, for example, Jing He, a Chinese uh, designer, to uh, make a commentary on Marta Rosler's very famous semiotics of the kitchen video, where Marta Rosler stands there and enacts all the activities that you make as a woman in the kitchen. But Ying Yi, she put, um, she built a VR set on and put it on her face, and she imitated, pretended that all the behavior and all the movements are controlled by the VR, but by the virtual world. So she puts it to the present, you know. So I did it basically, and it was uh, quite a success in the sense that um, I explained to the people that it's an exhibition you can own because if you give access or if someone allows you uh, to actually distribute these files, the file becomes property from everyone. So it's not, you know, like you cannot go to a museum or a gallery space and own an object that is exhibited, but you can own a file that you can rewatch or look at or store on your own virtual world whenever you want. But the nicest thing was actually that when I did it, this presentation a few times and I did different desktop exhibitions on different topics, uh, there was someone who actually made a beautiful comment and said that uh, it reminds him of Marcel Duchamp, who had this very famous work that, uh, co that is called um, something with a lease, but he had, he made miniatures in the 60s, 70s, miniatures of his own work and put it in the small suitcases to carry them around and show it to different people. And what I do is as a curator, but also obviously as a designer, I have all my work in my laptop, which is my suitcase, and I can pull these different types of work out uh, and up and show it to people. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, you see the picture of uh, Jing He that specifically made it work for this desktop exhibition that I then presented to, uh, to the audience. Uh, and yeah, and you can obviously see how that would technically look like. I would be sitting obviously afterwards and talking to Paul Feigefeld mm -hmm. and re like reviewing or looking at the whole idea of the desktop exhibition and the themes. But it's quite interesting because you have an audience, you, ha you can reach a different audience and especially in the times of COVID-19 you have yeah. to ask yourself what are the different new ways of bringing an exhibition to people and for me for example personally it was really tiring to watch any kind of talks or lectures or anything online because I had to withdraw from the online world because I was trapped to this computer anyway but if you have a person who guides you through an exhibition it's different you know and I and and um yeah, you have, you have also the framework of a time to, or the possibility to actually ask questions, which I find very important in that kind of sense. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's so interesting to see this image because, of course, it all already makes you nostalgic for when we could do things like this. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder what your thoughts are about this idea of the desktop exhibition um, as a kind of future oriented practice and how COVID has disrupted your thinking about your your own work and where you think it will take you next. I mean, the, 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 I, did, I did a desktop exhibition. I presented the format of a desktop exhibition at the university in Berlin in a Zoom lecture, I think about six weeks ago. And one of the students actually asked the same question, uh, thinking or asking uh, if I think the, the future will be school, the schooling online, you know? And I personally, I'm completely against it. I really hope that it will be a learning course for most people that, that education has to still take place. Uh, and I mean, a museum at the end is a place for education. It's an educational or, or, or center for mediation. Um, so it's also a gallery space. But I do think that we cannot withdraw formally from the physical experience. Uh, absolutely not. It's, I still think we live in a world where both worlds or both spaces, the virtual and the physical, um, is um, is relevant, you know, because it's a fact both exists, and you know the internet is also a space, you could say. Um, but I think we are getting better in understanding the opportunities we have with it, and also the expanding networks 
but uh, I still don't think that you can experience a physical object as much as you can experience it in a physical space. If that's the questions you're, if question you're asking, Grant. Let me ask you another question about the desktop exhibition, which relates to your initial question, is technology sexist? Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that the desktop exhibition, of course, is itself an example of technology, and in a way, technology redeployed or shifted, transformed. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you have a sense of yourself as applying feminist principles to your own practice, and in particular, the way that you use technology to get your content across. Is that a feminist project for you? No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I have to say, for me, it was um, opportunity. Just because, you know, like if you've been as a curator and as a designer, um, I had access to physical spaces pretty much my whole practice. And then suddenly we closed the physical space of Depot Basel down and uh, I was still craving moving objects or in this case it was became files. Uh, from one side to the other, recontextualizing. Um, and in a way, we, we all know how much it costs to ship objects from a, from a to B, from one side to the world to the other. And you have to ask yourself, is it on, on one hand, you know, ecologically, but also economically, um, the right decision to do? So is it, is it really about the actual object or is it about a depiction of the object, you know? and in that kind of sense, uh, the theme that was given from the conference was my theme, but uh, I have to say it was well paid because it was in a Swiss inter institution. And you always have to ask yourself when you work as a practitioner, an independent practitioner, is it worth, is it worth the hassle? You know, is it worth the efforts that you put in? Mm -hmm. So you either put a lot of effort in because you know your audience, you know the context and you know you, you, you get something out of it or you have a proper discourse that, that makes your own practice richer in that kind of sense, but not richer in terms of monetary context, but more in terms of uh, value and content. And in this case, I really knew that it, it's going to be a really interesting uh, platform for me to talk about design without talking about design in the most literal sense, but bringing this different different uh, formats and methods of design or actually you know like that design can be a video that uh, design can be a, a text you know like Tamar Shafir wrote a fantastic text about the AI and the voice of AI and why it is actually female you know um, so I had different different types of voices of people of existing work that I could show but it's almost like making an exhibition physically only that you have full control of the files because there's no, you know, I also didn't have to insure anything. <laughs> <laughs> and the nice thing was that at the end of the talk, I really said, I, I, the, I opened the slide and I said, okay, guys, this is my email address. If you will own, want to own this exhibition, I can send it to you by the transfer. And I actually did. I think there were seven people that were really gladly uh, accepted this file. I obviously had to ask everyone else before if it's okay for me to for example download the files online yeah. or source the material credit it accordingly because at the end it's a full package you know it's it's a lot of work because you have to be detailed and have to, you have to always make sure when you do presentation that you have the right captions that you have to the right mm -hmm. date you know that you have to that everything is also spelled correctly you know which is also a huge challenge it's interesting how these uh, expanded techniques of curation often run into the boundaries of intellectual property rather than real estate property you know it's not like restrictions of capital just go away they sort of transform um matilda can you while we're on this topic of changing the methodologies and formats of practice can you show us some other examples of things that you've done that maybe feel somewhat like exhibitions but also like other things like theatrical performances sure. for example i mean i have i have done a few but i actually think uh one thing that i personally very much i mean I work in education also. I mean, I, I, I find it very interesting to bring this kind of radical, weird ideas into discussion in the educational context. So in this case, for example, um, I, that's something that I did only in January, which is an exhibition from the uh, graphic design department that uh, specifically is called Digital Graphic Design in Hamburg. And they asked me to come in because they were struggling with exhibiting digital design you know because what you're going to do 
screens, you know, and then that's it. And that's your, that's your experience. So, and I was always interested in, you know, like this immersive spaces where you suddenly you open a door, you walk in and you feel like you're somewhere else, you know, it's like, it's exactly what virtual reality does at the end. So we call it spectator mode because it's one of the modes that you have uh, within the virtual reality world. And it was kind of interesting because I walked in, you know, and I really like starting from scratch because it's not about me be being the artistic director. At the end, you work with students and the students have to have a framework and the possibilities to bring their own vision and ideas into the discussion. So what we did is, and they had also produced work for over a period of one year, different kind of work that is digital. So we did this, we created on one hand, we created a whole virtual reality world and exhibition it as such in, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the glass itself. But we made a whole installation where on one hand, of course, on the screen, you have different types of work that we've done in the past, but we made somewhere between a kiosk <laughs> and a bar <laughs> mm. where we actually had also physical merchandise that the students wanted to sell on, on this open day, you know, because it was specifically made for four days of open day where people or visitors from outside would come and, and view the show or view uh, the work of these different departments within the school. And, but it was a complete collaborative effort, you know, it was a com open conversation where we thought how can we narrate to an audience that comes from Hamburg and also is a, is a broad audience uh, the idea of what a class in, of digital design actually builds and what kind of themes they bring into the discussion or, or contemporary times. And it was interesting because it was, you know, as you can see, we, we played a lot with lights and, and we made a whole thick installation that would kind of bring this idea of, of this kind of total environment in mm. the discussion. So it was not about, you know, having 20 screens and a little caption underneath and people would walk in and you have to kind of you have to seek the information, but, but you know how the information is always laid out. It's always a picture or a screen with a little bit of text underneath. But if you walk in and you so suddenly you're in an alternative world or a world that narrates all these ideas, you know, through yeah. experience. One thing I wanted to ask you about, and this is a great example, Matilda, is mm -hmm. how you use your own design practice in your curatorial projects. So you already gave us the example of the book that you designed. And here's another um, example where you're really operating both conceptually and visually at the same time and really creating physical space, um, which I perceive as quite unusual. Certainly in my own practice, I think of myself as the curator, then there might be a designer whose work we're showing, there might be another person who's an exhibition designer, then a graphic designer. So there's a very clear sense of division of labor, I guess I would say. And it seems to me that you're very interested in breaking through those dividing lines. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I'm a, I mean, to be honest, Ben, I'm, I'm a designer in the first place. You know, I just, just became, someone, someone once said to me, oh, you're a curator. And suddenly I became a curator. But I mean, when, I, when we did Depot Basel seven years, we had money for the first two years to actually pay a graphic designer. Then we, we realized that it's too slow to work with them person that is ex you know external and I'm trained as a product and graphic design and in the arts context so I did graphic de like I did the graphic design for five years you know um, when we do or develop exhibitions and it's about the scenography I would always co-develop or develop it myself you know and I have actually a few examples uh, one of my favorites actually in terms of scenography um, is this one in one second there's a few <laughs> yeah, everyone can look at my website afterwards um but when i was asked for example to make a jewelry show and i have no or i had no vivid uh, knowledge about contemporary jewelry i liked this thought of this magical black box that you get as a gift you know a, a jewel box and i wanted to transform it as a walk-in installation so mm. basically outside you're standing and it's just black thick big box that you suddenly walk into and inside that box you have these 10 different uh, practitioners that we commissioned to make jewelry based on the theme of fake mm. uh, but we also wanted to give it a shift in that kind of sense and we put a screen outside into the window 
because jewelry for me is something that you put on for yourself but you also put it on to be adored or looked at you know it's an attention seeker and it's an attention grabber so we wanted to bring this kind of idea of a cctv into the windows but also by bringing people from outside to the inside because in this space particular space where we did this exhibition we had windows outside you know uh, and we thought how can we how can we make people walk inside and wanting to walk into the black box and we thought we have to show the outside and kind of basically tease them in yeah. a way um, kind of to come in the other yeah. thing that, that image though suggests is that you're thinking right. about a certain degree of surveillance so there's an mm -hmm. invitation but there's also once you're in the box also you have strangers from outside looking at you looking at the jewelry and yeah. that prompts a, another question I was wondering about, which is whether your explorations of this analog digital divide and the passage between those two spheres, whether that also includes an investigation into the corrosive and negative impact of technology and the way that it's distorting perception. Again, we could think about that politically, but I wonder if there's a kind of critical aspect to that part of your practice. Of course, I mean, there's always a subtext, but I think the most in interesting and intriguing thing is to package this criticality in, in something that you know that still grabs the attention to to a general public you know it's, mm -hmm. they, it's almost like hosting again you know you have to invite these people to come in and be part of this conversation and maybe on the first glance they think oh it's a nice intervention but you want to make them think you want to make them think why they're standing outside looking at the screen that obviously is a, is a notion of surveillance that most people that these days don't be comfortable with. We are constantly so, is so surveilled. But to put that in front of them, to be, so to, for them to be reminded, I always find that important. So I, I always kind of like this shift of this tension to, to address these things all the time, actually. There's no criticality within anything that you display for the outside world, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you about also, Matilda, is the experience that you had earlier this year of going to see Andrea Zatel and spend some time with her. Um, mm -hmm. And she's an artist I, I expect a lot of people in the audience will know uh, has this kind of incredible practice, which she sometimes frames as a business, A to Z Enterprises, Andrea Zatel, mm -hmm. A to Z Enterprises. And that suggests this kind of total vision or a kind of lived Gesamtkunstwerk in which she's providing for every aspect of her own upkeep, used the word survivance a second ago, and she yeah, seems like okay. emblematic of that. I mean, that's, so I can was, you tell us about your experience with her? I was obviously totally motivated to see her on one hand because I was always, I was always interested in her practice, how, he, how she actually talks or displays or produces design without calling it necessarily design. Mm -hmm. But when you talk to her about it, it's interesting because she actually said you cannot speak about design. You cannot speak about art without speaking about design. But for her, you know, like, like she has this, as you already mentioned, she has this kind of total practice in a sense because she isolated herself. And I have to say, for me, this corona uh, virus is, was quite an interesting state. I mean, for everyone, of course. But um, I, I left to the desert in the beginning because I wanted to be in isolation. Uh, I wanted to withdraw from my everyday to understand or learn from a practice that I admire myself, that shifts between art and design but that it works within spaces, work, works within objects. I mean, she's not really working within digital space, but I wanted to see what kind of rigor is behind it. Mm -hmm. And the most fascinating how she, for example, she, she structures her week, you know, like, like on a Monday, she would work only by herself. On Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., the whole team would meet for power hour. Power hour would mean that we would clean and talk to each other for one hour. It's almost like you don't clean afterwards when you're done with the work. You, you prepare yourself to work, to, to be very specific and very rigorous throughout the day to make the work even more specific. You know, it's, it's, she's, she's so clear-minded in the way how she works and how she structures it. So I stayed for, with her as a resident for a month meaning to stay there and work with her. I helped her with the production of her porcelain bowls. 
I had quite a few conversations with her and uh, I took the time to work on a few projects because I'm, for example, I'm, I started to be very interested in theater and I would like to actually develop a theater play um, that talks about design within the theater scope. Mm. Um, and then Corona happened and she said I should stay and I stayed longer, I prolonged the, the time. But at some point I had to obviously leave because no one knew how long it's going to take for anyone to be able to leave the US. And um, it seemed after two months almost being a desert that I have to come back. Because I obviously I'm working on a few projects and one of the projects actually talks also about the total within the design. Huh, okay. Can you show that one to us? Of course. Um, I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's work in progress, totally work in progress. And I actually have a few, a few slides uh, around that. And I think I'm going to start with showing who I work with right now. Um, because when you start curating an exhibition, it's always kind of interesting how you develop a theme. Mm. And in this case, uh, a curator who is actually also a designer, Damian Fopp, who is at the Museum Fickerstadt in Zurich, he called me. And he basically asked me if I want to co-curate an exhibition with him. And we said it has to be a contemporary exhibition because we are lacking contemporary exhibitions and very the young contemporary exhibitions in the museum landscape and a little bit more radical maybe and also kind of something something that opens up a new theme, you know. Mm -hmm. So we did few calls with different practitioners that we both are interested in. And the first practitioner that we talked uh, to was soft baroque, Sasha Stuching. And one thing that was interesting is she said that they are not interested in the singular object anymore. They are interested in total environments. Mm. And after this conversation, we put down the phone and I opened my iPhone. And that day, Wim Crowell, who was the uh, guy who founded Total Design as a, as a studio in the, I think, 70s in, the, in Holland, mm. he died. And then I looked at my co-curator and I said, Damian, it's going to be total space. <laughs> mm. And then we basically, uh, you see here the work of Soft Baroque. Uh, we, we decided to work with them and represent also not the singular designer or the icon of genius, but also really work with the collective, with, with the studio as such. And these were basically pretty much what we did. You know, we couldn't do studio visits during the times uh, in Corona. We had to see them in the online space, in the Zoom space that we are also in right now which I actually think should not be called design and dialogue. It should be called design in Zoom. <laughs> and, then you, and then you could actually partner up with Zoom and they sponsor you. <laughs> oh, see, where were you when we started all this, Matilda? <laughs> uh, you know, next time. Yeah. Uh, so basically in this exhibition, we're working with four studios. The first one is Soft Baroque and the second one is Luftdeck, who basically very much work with interventions of lights within architecture. But the interesting thing is also how, how does it look like when they build a space or a total space. Mm -hmm. And then here is a conversation where we started developing the actual physical uh, scenography. Because in this case, again, back to what you asked before, I'm not only a curator, but I'm a scenographer. So Damian and I work by developing or helping develop their spaces, but also the narrative, the dram dramaturgy of, of uh, actual mm -hmm. exhibition but also developing obviously the, the, um, the parts of their work uh, and how it manifests itself. The third studio is Suchuk and Bratkurs who very much work in digital space. They generate CGI generated images and have developed the practice really from scratch by getting to know all the tools and tricks by YouTube, watching YouTube videos, which is also a phenomenon of, of our uh, times. Yes, and the question also, yeah. What does school deliver if you can actually learn everything you want in the internet? <laughs> uh, this is Damien. I, I chose this picture so, so you guys also see how my co curator looks like. <laughs> and then the fourth, fourth studio is uh, Quang and Caputo, who is um, they are like a Swiss based studio that actually of, it's official now since a week they win the uh, Grand Prix, uh, the Swiss Design Award, but the big uh, award this year. Uh, which we didn't knew obviously last year when we selected them, but we actually really think that they represent a lot of uh, important things within the landscape. Mm -hmm. And they are developing um, also one of these four spaces. But in order to actually explain you how the exhibition works and looks, I have to show you the exonometry, 
because we're really pushing or trying to push all parameters of an exhibition, of a design exhibition, uh, where we really try to more or less um, create spaces that deliver an experience to an audience that are immersive, where not only you know you walk in and you see all the material and all the you know visual kind of aspects of someone's practice but also that you also can dwell in you know mm-hmm. so it's exactly what virtual reality does through you know the the goggles mm-hmm. is what we want to recreate within within the space so as you can see here mm-hmm. the exhibition doesn't start with a text it's going to start with an audio so when you walk in there will be a voice saying Total design is an experience. Total design is a fantasy. Total design is spatial, visual, and virtual. You know? So we really want to open it up more as an installation and um, triggering kind of different senses because we want to withdraw from this idea that a museum has to be didactic, you know? that it has mm-hmm. to actually you know, have this narrative of placing an object next to a text and then your brain reads one thing and the other and that's the information that you have which in my point of view stops make you stop stop you stops you from making thing no stops you from thinking something unexpected yeah yeah you know question um this is a bit of a self-interested question because as you know i work a lot on materiality and craft Mm -hmm. uh, elements of design and one thing that strikes me a lot about this project matilda is that it really forces that question of what the digital is doing to our sense of the material. And yeah. if you look at some of the practitioners that you're working with here, um, like Softwork or like Kwang and Kaputo, um, there's a sense that materiality is taking on a different guise where it feels almost like it's in some way bearing the stress of digital distortion as it's sort of coursing around the object, like this kind of digital wind. And mm-hmm. I wonder what your thoughts about that are because earlier you said that you felt that education was um, still going to be very much dependent on face-to-face, in-person, physical reality as its context. And I I would love to hear your thoughts about what materiality means for designers now that it might not have felt it meant 10 years ago. I mean, um... I can obviously only judge it from my, I mean, what I said before about the educational part, uh, uh, about how I really still think it's dependent on physicality still is obviously my perspective, you know? I mean, uh, when, when I talked to the guys who are running this graphic design digital course, they were so happy to be not having to travel to Hamburg every day because they, their work is based on screen work. So, you know, the, their world is the screen and they, uh, they found it so much so much more rewarding to not have to travel you know that's a question also that you have to ask yourself the relevance how relevant is travel these days or will be in the future actually um, but in that kind of sense uh, with soft Park, for example they decided to be in lockdown in Slovenia where Sasha is coming from and it was really interesting they were craving physicality so much so in order to work on this exhibition and the objects that are actually going to be placed within the exhibition, Nick had to constantly find some sort of material in kind of some kind of DIY stores that he was not so aware of because he's not living in, in Slovenia usually. So I think the materiality will be never completely withdrawn. We do physicality, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a built environment, you know, but it's also when you think about how industrial designers these days, they use VR technology to reproduce, for example, a landscape where a train will be placed in the future that they are currently engineering and designing. Mm. Uh, so they do man- they create the idea of the world around it, but the actual test of the height of seating and how the side table and the lamp on top of it will work still has to be built, you know, because mm-hmm. it's still a physical body that will be transported from A to B via a train that needs to understand the, the, how this built environment, how this physicality will respond or how the body will respond to this kind of uh, built environment. So we will be, I think, never will be, we were never able to withdraw entirely from it. So long as we have bodies, exactly. As long as we have bodies, and I hope, yeah. uh, I don't know. <laughs> Um, another question about this project 
that I would love to hear you talk about is the question of nationality and location. And mm. this is something I was very keen to talk to you about um, anyway, because you seem to me, although you're very itinerant and have spent time in Chicago and spent time with Andrea Zatel in the desert here in America, I think of you, rightly or wrongly, as a very European curator. And obviously that has been your context for the most part over the past mm. years, the years in Basel. Mm. Um, and I, I wonder if you have a vantage on um, European design as still having some kind of specific identity or character, or whether you think that it's totally wide open now and it really doesn't matter where somebody is from because we all inhabit the screen-based digital interchange. I don't think it, it matters. And I think it's a challenge to really, every time when you invite a group of people to, to contribute to a project that you kind of uh, diversify or have these polyphonic voices. I mean, if, in this case, for, for I mean, the, the thing is that if you make a country exhibition or country design exhibition, it's really hard because you have a limited budget. It's, it's always de it's usually dependent on budget, but some, it's also you, usually dependent on the attitude that you have towards the curation or the content making. And I mean, in this case, we specifically, you know, in the first room, you have, you know, the first installation will be Quan uh, Caputo uh, because they're fairly the youngest, you know, or the more established, or you know, uh, um, studio. And they are wild, and they talk very, very much in their installation about um, a methodology of attitude and, and, and material kind of experience. So it's going to be rough. You want to start rough in this in this exhibition space. The second studio they were presenting is Luftberg. I mean, obviously, I've been in Chicago. I've seen the studio many times, but I uh, but um, they are. Uh, I mean, Sean is American, but he, uh, her, par her parents, his parents are not actually American. And then you have uh, Petra, who is German. So we do show also kind of you know that there's a diversification within the studios that we we've, we've selected. The yeah. studio that we're working in with terms of graphic design are three guys from Basel um, that we've never worked with before, but we thought they are radical in the terms of graphic design they are doing. And then Suchuk and Bradfuss, they are uh, four guys who, one of them, uh, his parents are Italian and the other two guys, their parents are Turkish. So you do, you know, like it's, at the end I always think that you have a program, you have a selection of people you work with there. What counts is on one hand the, the names that you can see, it's, it, you know, the name is a display also of, of, of um, nationality in some ways, you know, uh, very often. But we wanted to create this kind of, um, but I mean, we have not succeeded, I have to say, you know, I have to really admit, Glenn, we could have done even better, especially after this turbulent year, I, I was actually thinking that we could have looked for more voices that have not entered the canon yet. And it's hard, but it, every kind of little step, it's not about postponing it to next year, and to the next next exhibition it's more about introducing different kind of names and we have one space where we ask 10 different people about an exhibition that is immersive uh, or an installation from the last 10 years a recent one and we have brought a lot of people in that have never been ex exhibited in an exhibition space you know but also not only singular people again but more i don't know departments of schools, you know, that one is uh, in Sandberg Institute, there's one that is called uh, um, Institute for Immediate Space, or in Geneve, you have uh, one place that is called, in Geneve, like in the HAT, it's in the school called HAT, there's called MA Space and uh, Communication, and mm -hmm. there's a collective called Troyan Collective, you know, where a lot of, I think, uh, one girl is Lebanese descent, um, so we're trying to bring not only Central European uh, people in, and I hope that in my next ex exhibition I will be even better with it, you know. And in 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 two years when you when we have this conversation, we will we will not have this conversation because it's clear that everyone has in, in, in implemented it, like yeah. like it's like it's the most natural thing in the world. But we have also to give more space. Um, to different voices, not only in exhibitions, but in general, in the whole discourse, mm. by hiring people, um, by addressing, yeah, I think it's... it's I, like, um, I like thinking of you as like a, a human crowbar that's prying open these institutions so that they can be made available to a broader range of people. Um, 
I see it, you know, I see that we're almost to question time, but do you have one last project that you want to show us first before we stop the share screen? I definitely have a few. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one more, one more. Um, I mean, this I mean, this exhibition basically that I just showed is going to be up on the 20th of October. It's going to be quite wide and radical, but um, no, I think, I think maybe it's question time. Question time. Okay. All right. So question time. If folks have questions, um, please put them in the chat box. Uh, if you don't mind mm -hmm. stopping, share a screen, uh, Matilda, because then we can see you better. Oh, yeah, of course. So, sorry. Yep. Um, so please put your questions in the chat box. I'll, I'll just ask one um, to get us rolling. Do you have other, apart from your own practice, are there mm -hmm. other models that you're seeing out there, other institutions that you're looking at and following that you would want to direct attention towards as things to, you know, not necessarily exemplars to follow, but things to at least pay attention to? I, I, yes, actually. Um, I was hosting two weeks ago on a Saturday, I was hosting a theatre conference. It was a Zoom conference. We were 100 people. Every person had to host one talk of one person who runs an institution. And the most impressive one was uh, Contact Manchester. Uh, mm. The guy, Matt Fenton, who runs it, decided 14 years ago that the era of an artistic director is over. He uh, basically elected or brought in uh, a body of like, you know, like a, a group of people that are aged between 18 and 25 years old, uh, not only to be part of, uh, you know, like the board or something like that, but executive boards, decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, which I found interesting because the first time that he thought he's going to open up, he decided to give a budget of a whole year by making an open call. He, he printed a poster with a number and in, that was hanging in Manchester all over the place. And it was saying, do you want to make culture? Call me. And then obviously Manchester, contact Manchester. At the end, 14 people called him. Uh, I don't know, a retired teacher, a woman who was a florist, uh, different ages, different backgrounds, different nationalities, everything that the UK kind of bring in, you know? And he was sitting with 14 people and at the end, seven people with a year annual budget, you know, with an annual budget, make programming where, you know, you had a fear today about, I don't know, um, Arabic women boxing in this and the, I, don't, I, I forgot actually the, the programming as such because he never really talked about it so much. Mm -hmm. But what he did is he opened up culture to everybody, you know? So if you wanted, you could participate. But on top of everything, he decided at some point not to only have his people on the board as, you know, like free labor, participant but actually on the payroll and he introduced it permanently and he became also when you follow him on instagram it's super interesting because he really said it says contact manchester for everyone and mm. it is really for everyone and mm. i asked him how do you get these people on board and he said you have you have to ask people you have to host you have to invite people so he would get a group of kids over to mcdonald's and to kfc, KFC chicken and these kids were asked other kids and say, hey, we're doing, we are, we are theater performance institution. Do you want to participate? Mm. And then you test them in the beginning, you know, uh, you test them in the beginning because you want to see if they are, you know, like have an interest in, in, in the, in the um, institution as such. And after you tested them, you hire them because you know they will work within the team. And that's how we did. So, yeah, yeah I think. Yeah, a you know, there's, a, there's a kind of follow the money principle there at work because I've often been struck in my own experiences, certainly here in America, the way that museum boards really are like a check on progress in a lot of ways, you know, because the fact that the institutions, particularly nonprofits, are so dependent on them um, really radically limits what nonprofit the non nonprofit sector in general can do because it's really the paymasters that are ultimately making the decisions about hiring and firing and even programming in many cases. And I guess that prompts the thought that um, really radical interventions need to occur on the level that you're talking about, you know, on board level, on staffing level, really on the level of budgets and, you know, mm -hmm. spreadsheets and Excel documents, you know. Um, I wonder how optimistic you are about those kinds of overall dispositions of power changing now. 
we mind systemic change. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, I think I find the word change tricky because changing means like I'm changing my clothes and I change them back tomorrow, you know, but it's about transformation. It's about the question, how can we implement this kind of ideas permanently? Yeah. And it was interesting because in this, in this uh, conversation and this theater, uh, towards the end of a Zoom call, uh, we introduced this kind of game. You had to write on a piece of paper what you want to give and what you want to get. Mm-hmm. And then, and then what, you know, I wrote, what I wrote on my paper, I said, I wish that in the future I will never have to be in an only white uh, Zoom conference ever in my life. Because that was the case. I mean, it was, it was organized within Switzerland. It, I mean, everyone had access to it. But the question also, some people are used to have access and some people are not. So how are we going to get the people that are not used to access in and that's that's what you do by hosting yeah. that's why that's what you do by inviting someone and getting someone in and that person invites another person yeah 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 that's um i might just hear i usually do this at the end but that's just so on point that i just men- might mention that on friday we have uh stephen burks coming back as a host again and he's going to yeah. be talking to the editors of deem journal and i'm not sure if you've um, run into that yet but um, the the two um, two editors that are joining us are Marquis Stillwell and New Gotha, and it's such a perfect example of what you're talking about. Where we felt we needed to expand design and dialogue, so it wasn't just my voice as host. So we had another host, and then he's inviting people that we would not have necessarily thought to invite. So it's that kind of um, it's a, it like the cover of that book that you showed us right at the beginning. It's this kind of associative, network based extension of connections, and I feel like. In some ways, that's almost like the core principle of your practice is that idea of a kind of radical, unending connectivity, you might say. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in breaking formats, you know? I mean, like, um, I, that's why I think theater is so fascinating. I, I find theater fascinating because in the way I was teaching in the last or past years, I was, for me, it was interesting that the moment when you ask someone to design something, that person's going to reproduce everything that exists, you know? Yeah. We are too conditioned to withdraw from everything that we know. Mm-hmm. But the moment when you ask students to think about, you know, what, you know, like a feeling, you know, like, like, like when I did, was teaching at the AA, uh, I did the speculative semi- seminar about interior comforts. And one of my students, when I asked him five times, uh, when I asked him where you feel most comfortable, he talked about the couch, he talked about all these physical already designed items, but I really said to him, Jean-Pierre, I want you to give me a feeling, you know, through the feeling you will design something that is completely unexpected. And then he said, hot shower. The most comfortable place in this whole world is being on a hot shower. And I said, so forget everything that you know. And I said to him, do you remember Men in Black when they come in the film and they do this and then all your memory is erased? I want your memory to be erased and you only have to think about the hot shower and this departing from the hot shower, you will be somehow able to think about designing something without reproducing. Yeah. And at the end, all this, all, all these ideas that he had were completely, you know, like he tried to, to distance himself from everything that he knows. So mm-hmm. I think the way I try to make exhibitions or develop formats or think about products, I think about science fiction, about props, and how these kind of different ideas can manifest themselves to transform the existing. Because yeah. we will not change the industry within a very vast amount, but we can bring different thoughts for theater to mm-hmm. the fore. That's super inspiring. Thank you, Matilda. Um, I have a question here from Jennifer Hoffman. Jennifer, do you want to ask directly, or I can read it out? I always like people to ask when they can uh, manage to uh, <laughs> the technology, yeah. Jennifer, are you there? But if you haven't, Glenn, you should look into Jennifer Hoffman's work. She's a Chicago-based uh, artist. Oh. I had a work, I did a studio visit with her last year. Was oh, it cool. already one and a half years ago? My God, I'm not sure she can tune in, so I'm gonna just um, go ahead and, and read her question. She says, in keeping with the idea of transformation, do you feel it can be an artist's responsibility to also open their practice to hosting, so to speak, to collaborate with others within one's work, so that if an opportunity arises to show or exhibit, it can become an opportunity to include more voices? Always. I mean, 
I mean, in, in her practice of, is, I mean, she works mainly with porcelain or ceramics mm -hmm. um, or clay, but she also draws. And I mean, she, she could do that, of course. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the process of making um, a vessel can be as collaborative as making an exhibition or as making as a, you know, I think, I think the implementation of collaboration is, can, I mean, can be technically implemented almost everywhere, even though only in the jewelry context, I find it interesting that in, in the jewelry world, it's such a solitary, minimal, small work, but even though there, to be honest, you know, because you obviously, you go from supplier to, pro, to a production assistant. Yeah, but I mean, I think collaboration and that kind of attitude towards the, the discipline, yeah, can be implemented yeah. everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, a quick question from Marianne Engelbach. Uh, she just wants to know who's the person at the Manchester Contact uh, Institution was you mentioned? It's Matt Fenton. Matt, uh, Matt with double T and then Fenton. Great. Brilliant yeah. guy. Um, you know, I, I see we have a couple of leading collaborative craftspeople uh, listening in, including David Clark and David B. Lander. Um, Probably not other people not named David too, presumably. I was thinking particularly of David Clark's uh, work with Tracy Rolage and Claire Toomey, the great uh, bookmaker and ceramicist. And um, their presence here just gave me um, thought of another question, which is how the relationship between collaboration and expertise works in your view, because you've been talking about collaboration as this disruptive and you know, almost like a vaporizing technique, like the idea of like the men in black pen, like zap, you have to rethink everything that you knew. But presumably when people come into a collaboration, they're also bringing with them a lot of weight. And a lot of that comes from their own training and their own trajectories. And I wonder how you've found that working in collaborative situations, this idea of basically specialism within collaborations and how you respect other people's expertise. Are you asking them or asking me? I'm asking you, Matilda. You're the guest. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how would you answer this question? I think it's crucial. That's why I'm asking. Because I think that um, collaboration, well, it, it, of course, what it obviously does is expose your own vast tracts of ignorance, because mostly what you don't know is everything but also what it highlights is the um, particular shape of your expertise. And I think you learn a lot about your own specialism by collaborating. That's my take on it. That it's, it's almost like um, you know, a negative casting of your repertoire that allows you to yeah, see it. I, would, I would actually uh, see it a little bit different because you know, like when the classic kind of design organization or design, you know, like people used to be you know, experts in specific fields, and yeah. then would work within an organization um, where different people come together and they would deliver it to one. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, I mean, the most magical moments that I had in my life, and it doesn't matter where I worked, is where different minds come together and then magic happens. Literally, it's magic, you know? Yeah. It's a form of cultural or, you know, a magic. And you cannot expect from someone to know everything. And when I, when I teach, for example, and I have the impression that my students think that they, with the iPhones, they can take great pictures, you know, and then uh, they can, I don't know, build it by themselves and make the model themselves and um, make all these different steps and thinking about distribution, communication, writing texts. I mean, I always think that you have to be true to yourself in your practice and ask yourself, what are you really good in, you know? Mm -hmm. And also, you know, like in this, in that sense, I have also encountered so many practitioners who suffer from, you know, mental health problems because they put so much pressure on themselves by thinking that they have to deliver everything sourcing from their own bodies and minds. Yeah. But I find um, the gesture and notion of working with others and collaborating the most, you know, most uh, rewarding actually in, in, in the discipline of design, architecture, and mm -hmm. I actually think we have to withdraw from this all unique body of, of the icon and, and the creator. I think it's the mo mo my most, most projects that I'm really intrigued by are usually based on the collaboration between at least two practitioners. Mm -hmm. Amazing. 
Because yeah. you would grow from yourself on your own thoughts and opening a different world right. or bringing a different world in. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there, Matilda, and that's a great note to leave it on. Um, on if anything, if 20, <laughs> well, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that, um, you know, individual ego definitely needs to be uh, put into the context of conversation, collaboration, and respect for others. And we're more mutually dependent than ever before, even as we're finding ourselves isolated in so many cases. So what you're saying, I feel like is, is so, um, so important right now. So thanks for that. And thanks for being with us. It's been an amazing conversation. I've super enjoyed it. And I'm sure everybody else has as well. And, and it was not glitchy. No, you were not glitchy. You mean te technologically okay. glitchy. In, in no sense were you glitchy, Matilda. It was perfect. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Come back on thanks Friday. For coming. Yeah. And thanks. Um, please, please come back Friday for the editors of Deem Journal. And then I'll be back as host on Monday with, um, remarkably, with the Duke of Devonshire. So come back and hear his thoughts about how he's situating contemporary design at Chatsworth. And that's all for now. Thanks again, Matilda Kraskowski. It's been great to have you on Design and Dialogue or Design in Zoom. <laughs>